Okay, so listen, thanks, thanks everyone for joining us and welcome to this afternoon's webinar, which is the Digital Reboot for Business. Today you'll be hearing from Sarah Dodd, who's our digital business strategist, who will have a look at the digital mindset and skills that companies need to adopt moving forward. And we'll also hear from Sandy Murray, who's our De Director of Apprenticeships. And Sandy will give you an overview of our graduate apprenticeship programmes, what they are and what they do, etc. Um, so before I hand over to Sarah, I'll just cover off some quick housekeeping. The session's being recorded. I've just pressed that button. Um, it'd be great and everybody's behaving themselves very well. So if you could switch off your cameras and keep your mics muted during the presentations, that would be fantastic. Just to make sure we get as good a quality at our webinar as possible. And at the end, after the following the chat from Sarah and Sandy, you'll also have the chance to ask questions. Now, you can either do that verbally or via the chat function. So without any further ado, Sarah, I'm going to hand over to you. And I'll drive. <laughs> Thank you, David. And welcome to everybody that's attending. I'm Sarah Dodd. I'm a digital business strategist here at Harriet Watt University. And um, I'm joined by Sandy Murray, our director of apprentices, who and we're going to hope to in this short session and just give you an overview um, and an insight into how Harriet Watt can help you um, and your organization uh, to develop and grow the talent you need in tomorrow's digital world. So today we welcome, I think, both employers and individuals um, that want to look at our programs as a way to upskill, reskill and recruit. So should we go through the next few slides then, David? Uh, just a little bit of history. These are slides just to give you a background of Harriet Watt and to understand the um, resonance and the legacy that it has in terms of delivering skills in a engineering age and new ages of innovation. And um, it all started with a conversation, as do most things. But um, uh, Harriet Watt has got a long pedigree of creating programs that really respond to industry and that can bring the skills that are required to make that industry accelerate and extend. And it's done that um, for nearly 200 years. We're facing our bicentennial um, next year. Great, next slide. So from that small beginning, we now have um, five different campuses and the largest one is here in Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, but we also have two smaller ones in Scotland up in Orkney where there's a lot of marine science and energy work being done to the borders where we focus on textiles, um, which is the main industry in that area. Um, but we also have fantastic campuses in Dubai and Malaysia, and you can see the numbers on the screen of the different types of uh, the numbers of students that attend there. Um, but each and all of us together make one global university and we capitalize on each other's strengths to do that and to give you the best service. So. So today I was really going to talk a little bit about um, what your digital strategy might be or what you really should be thinking about if you are looking to upscale, reskill and uh, recruit. And I'm sure everyone has heard of digital transformation. You can hardly avoid it. Um, and many of you may have already be addressing it just as a result of the COVID restrictions. But in essence, it's a really it's a strategic imperative for us all to transform our way of business and our way of communicating and interacting with staff and customers. And all of that is no longer um, something that we might think about on the far horizon, but something that's really facing us right now. And we need to do it and companies need to do it uh, to be resilient, to face a future that's changing very rapidly in front of us. But don't worry, you're not alone. There's a lot of companies that are also doing that uh, for everyone from the major institutions like the Scottish government, local authorities, councils, um, NHS, they're all involved in transformation. Um, and that actually includes the SME community and financial institutions. Everyone everywhere is trying to do much the same thing. So what is it about? It, to me, it's really about making a fundamental shift in your business model and mindset. And it's about thinking about what your business as usual can become. Um, so people talk about that new normal, but this is about how you can gain the resilience to thrive and improve um, respond to that disrupted marketplace and to use and optimize the technologies that you have or that you should be adopting. 
But in practice, it actually involves quite a few things, and a lot of it is reviewing and looking at upgrading and renewing your systems. People are working on old legacy systems that are really not capable of communicating with the wider platforms and media channels that we have today. It's looking at new patterns of working. We're all working in flexible environments. I'm sitting at my kitchen table right now, so that has changed. But to be flexible and adaptable is something your workforce wants and embraces, and I don't think we're going back to offices. Um, using technology, obviously, to streamline processes and operations, marketing, logistics, to communicate with your staff, customers, suppliers, general public, all of this is available now and at much lower cost. It's about getting the right integration of tools. Um, but you can gain cost and time efficiencies, and we're going to use that word data data that the data that you actually hold can help drive your decision making in making those choices. But you also have to have a good underpinning knowledge of your technical infrastructure of what connectivity you have, what the broad broad bandwidth is in your area or the territory that you're selling to. You have to understand what your customers, your suppliers and your competitors are doing um, so that you can work well and accelerate your business in this new model. But the benefits are great. You can reshape your business. You could embrace automation. You can connect with new markets, new audiences, and you're moving really kind of from a physical world to a virtual one, from standalone to the cloud. But the possibility there is that you can grow. So let's go to the next slide, David. So adopt a digital mindset. Now, we talk about growth mindsets quite a lot in technology, which is about failing and being willing to fail and learn from that and grow ahead. In a digital mindset, I think we just need to forget the fear factor. And we need to refocus and set your sights on making your business a tech-enabled business. So to do that, you have to assess your priorities and then look at optimizing what you have. Um, but to do this, you actually really need to focus on your people and you need to have people with the right skills and the right knowledge to do transformation and to get there. And in fact, people are your biggest asset. So giving them the tools and the know-how to work can make a huge difference between um, achieving economic growth or stagnating, or in fact, we've seen a lot of companies downsize and have to um, reduce their economic activity. But it's all about embracing change. And I mean, if you think about it, in the pre-digital age, we had pre-digital ages probably in the 90s. Um, you, we had different channels for communicating. We had TV, radio, newspapers, and those they never talked to each other or intertwined. And then we slowly did another adaptation and we got PCs and we had software on it that we could write things in Word or Excel or PowerPoint and print off physical objects. And then the Internet got us all engaged in new markets and starting to collaborate differently and connect differently and everything was on now on multiple devices on new platforms there's services channels the world is changing beneath our feet but actually i think it's going to go further and the next step is almost like a transformative age where the internet becomes almost invisible and we're living in a fluid seamless um reality where content is collected and distributed in multiple media and where audiences are no longer separated by time zones or locations and where data drives the direction of production and delivery. And of course, everything lives in the cloud. I heard it said the other day at a digital innovation event that uh, cloud centric infrastructure will become the norm in 2021. That's next year. Pretty quick. So the question you have to ask yourself is, is your team ready to adopt, adapt and deploy the technology to facilitate this change and to achieve the goals that your business needs to do? And if you don't, can you, you afford to lose the efficiency that digital offers and that your competitors will capitalize on? So let's look at digital skills in the next set. So really, it's about that point of keeping your staff skilled and I read a stat that said over 80% of jobs now require digital ability. And in fact, we all know you can't build a digital future without the right skills in place. And you may have heard a recent talk of a tech-led recovery out of the pandemic. 
But actually, I think that recovery and digital transformation needs to be strongly aligned to education. And that's, of course, where Harriet Watt can come in. Of course, you can go and get free courses online. You can use Coursera and Google, LinkedIn, Amazon. Um, but the real value, I think, in education-led recovery is in connecting with people through tech. So you need to invest in learning that ac accesses deep knowledge that can leverage experience and that can be shared in real life situations. By blending work and learning, you can compound the value of both and open the door to innovation. So investing in education to reboot your digital capacity has multiple benefits. It will promote a cultural change and a shift um, within your staff and within your teams. It creates stronger internal networks and can be motivating and revitalizing for your employees. And that helps you to retain the best employees because what you certainly don't want to lose are the people that know your business, have loyalty to it, but just need new skills to be able to advance it. It brings new skills and new perspective in from multiple sources and actually it helps individuals transform. And for individuals, I think I've read a stat that said 94% of individuals who knew that their company invested in their education and their continuing professional development would stay with that company. So it's well worth thinking about. So what do you need to do here? You need to get your team invested in, in a digital mindset. They need to be looking at your business goals and reviewing how you can use the tools and technologies to achieve that. Um, they need to also be flexible and adaptable and embrace change. They have to keep retraining. You can't stay in this tech world by training once and then leaving it for five years. You need to get, engage in a lifelong learning cycle and to retrain at least every five years in tech if not more often. And that's a way we're seeing a lot of is smaller, <clears throat> excuse me, modular courses that help people continue their learning throughout their working life. If you think about it, there's a lot of new jobs that have already emerged that are involving people with a deep sector knowledge um, combined with tech. And you see that in vert the new verticals like agritech or law tech or fintech. Um, so there's a lot of capacity for people on an existing teams with new technologies to move ahead into new roles and to take on different responsibilities. I think when you're building digital skills, you also really are thinking about empowering your workforce and you're really wanting to make them digital makers. So if you need people that can develop applications and software or assess and analyze data or use digital marketing or deploy to the cloud, they need to be able to write programs, to understand data, to feel comfortable and to have a digital business acumen to tie all those skills together and make them work. We all know the value now of digital engagement, so reflecting on that, you can also think about what has changed in your marketplace and how it's become a digital marketplace and how tools like social media are changing how you access and sell your product to different um, audiences. The benefits really of giving your digital competency to your whole team are, are immense and you will find that the collaboration and the creativity leads to innovation and that by bringing people together through that you can actually take big leaps ahead in scaling and growing your business. So we'll go to the last slide David. So upskill, reskill, recruit, here we are and you know it these are the three things that we think at Harriet Walt we can help you with. Um, when I looked at some stats, there was a, a KPMG report out with Harvey Nash recently, and it said that 67% of tech leaders could not find the talent they needed to do software development, to do become data scientists, to be IT business professionals who could solve problems, implement robust solutions, um, understand scale and sustainability. So it's really incumbent on us all to find different ways to keep our staff upskilled, reskilled, and, and to add new recruits to that list. One of our key programs at Harriet Watt is the Graduate Apprenticeship Scheme. It's bringing workplace learning right into your business um, and giving your staff that degree level education that they need to um, be deep thinkers and to understand what 
the application of these skills is. You can use graduate apprenticeships to upskill an existing employer, which will help them progress their career, future proofing their skills. You could reskill an, empl an employee from one role or department to another through a GA, or you could recruit a new person and take them on a journey where they learn with you through your business um, the skills they need to gain a degree. We have three particular programs that I think were very strong in this suit. One's our um, software development for business. Another is SC honors in data science, and then we have an MA honors in man IT management for business. So I'm going to let Sandy take over. He's the knowledgeable one about how these apprenticeships work and can take you through that. And I'm happy to answer any questions um, at the end that you might have. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Sarah, for the introduction uh, to myself. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, Sandy Murray, Director of Graduate Apprenticeships here at Heriot Watt, and along with my team here at Heriot Watt, we're here to assist uh, you in achieving all the points that Sarah's mentioned before and achieving the real potential within a range of employer employee uh, skills that require for the future. Next slide, David, please. So, what are graduate apprenticeships? They were introduced uh, through the, or funded through the apprenticeship levy, which the Scottish Government uh, has committed to expanding work-based learning through opportunities within the foundation, modern apprentice and graduate, graduate apprenticeships. These are the apprenticeship family, as they like to be called, and the Scottish Government are committed to continually increasing year on year the number of apprenticeships that are focused and working in the workplace. Graduate apprenticeships are designed to support employees, to develop their workforce, uh, provide work-based learning opportunities for all. They've been created in partnership with industry and a range of further education and higher education sectors. The apprenticeships combine academic knowledge with skills development to enable a GA employee to become more effective and productive in the workplace. And we have seen evidence of that within the sort of six to eight months of starting a GA, the employee starts to add value to the company as they start to grow in confidence as the GA progresses. Next slide, David, please. So the graduate apprentice uh, rules, if you like, they, they have to have a role within a company based in Scotland and working in Scotland. The role has to be relevant to the degree programme they're undertaking, and they have to attend uh, at least one day a week uh, here at Heriot Watt. Now, at that moment, that's carried out via online a blended learning approach, and we see that continuing for the foreseeable future. The GAs or graduate apprentices are here on their own merit, and it's based on a variety of their entry requirements, their academic qualifications and work experience, or a combination of all above. The university works with the employer, the graduate apprentice, to give the student every opportunity to succeed, and we hope the knowledge gained at the university will be embedded into the work, and this will quickly increase the business effectiveness on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. Where possible, we involve workplace projects, which will count towards their overall degree evidence. As we go through the degree, the job role is relevant, and if you see the notable progression in professional terms and development, increasing their knowledge base, skills, and confidence within the workplace and others around them. The courses, are, as I said, are fully funded by Skills Development Scotland, and it's an opportunity to earn where you learn. Uh, while you undertake a graduate apprentice scheme here at Heriot Watt. Next slide, David, please. The range of courses we have, they follow an approved apprenticeship framework. They, uh, they're levelled at le SCQF level 10, which is the honours level for a BEng, Bachelor of Science and a Master's degree uh, awarded here at Heriot Watt. There's no differentiation between a degree uh, a normal student, an undergrad student will uh, articulate from Heriot Watt with. It's exactly the same award. The evidence of the award uh, can be demonstrated through specific company projects, allowing the development of their skills in the workplace with some university exams to prove their overall ability. The framework itself allows the progression and growth to be demonstrated and recorded with candidates developing a greater understanding, bringing new ideas they are taught on the course into the business and also ideas from the business onto the course uh, what you can see there, it's considerably work-based, so it's 80% on the work-based. It's not a university plus internship, and again, it's paid by 
for skills development Scotland. So there's no payment from your company. Next slide, David, please. So how do we manage this? Now we have an individual learning agreement, the ILA, which manages the GA uh, and also their learning. It gives the GA time to think about why and what they need to learn, uh, where they need to learn it, and how to apply the learning. It also allows us to record demonstrated and demonstration of what they've learnt, and also the evidence that backs up all this. And it's kept within the portfolio to allow them to agree, uh, set milestones throughout their graduate apprentice program. Next slide, David, please. The roles and responsibilities within this. This nice triangle sits, and that's demonstrated on the screen here, with the university and the graduate apprenticeship. Graduate apprentice, sorry. There's a mentor and partnership opportunities between the university and the employer to allow knowledge and skills transfer between all parties. This tripartite approach requires the employer to provide appropriate and consistent workload support and guidance for work-based assessments to ensure the progress is in conjunction with the learning the GA is undertaking. The university, Herrick Watt, is here to provide access to all learning materials, be it virtual or on campus. We are still open for business on the campus, but with the limited resources. And we also provide updates to the employer on the progression and performance of their candidates. We also look at development and advise on work-based learning plans to ensure we get the best out of the graduate apprentice while they're working within the university and for the employer. So what does the GE have to do? Attend the lectures, submit tutorials, uh, study outside the university, contact time. This is where we ask for the embedding of sort of three to four hours per week out with the one day at Terry Watt to embed the knowledge within the workplace and maybe ask some stretching uh, uh, questions within the workplace of why do we do this this particular way. Complete the coursework and work-based learning and effectively manage uh, time manage themselves throughout the process to ensure they are meeting all the objectives of the course. Next slide, David, please. So how do we do this? Normally, we'd be starting in September. In semester one, we'd run September to December, semester two, January to May, and obviously semester three, May to September. We have to run all through the year to ensure we can maximise the evidence required to meet the degree overall uh, awarded. The GE can take vacation, and also this is the time management element of the course uh, by negotiation with the employer and the university. Next slide, David, please. Continuing delivery, one day a week, as I said, an additional four hours, a notional four hours of additional work to contextualise within the workplace. The delivery methods are flexible. Uh, it's not limited to the standard classroom. We sometimes infill with traditional stu students. Uh, it's led by different levels of our own academic teams here, professors and world leaders and experts in the key areas that have been taught. We do some distance learning as well, and also some directed uh, learning throughout the course. The projects are work-based orientated. That allows you to act actively participate in a work-based element or project that's happening to allow you to gain the knowledge and experience and again, add value to the overall uh, outcomes that we're trying to achieve. The projects are also uh, assisted by one academic and one industry supervisor, which will be nominated as the year it progresses. Key to remember, delivery methods may vary for each uh, course and result in a careful, and must result in careful management uh, for each to achieve the overall final degree awarded here at Herriot Watt. Next slide, David, please. As Sarah mentioned, we're focusing today on three key areas, which are the IT management for business, IT software development for business, and data science. But just as an FYI, we also have a range of other courses that are delivered here that support the upskilling and driving forward of the economy here based in Scotland. Next slide, David, please. Just give you a brief overview of the courses. Uh, these slides will be made available uh, after the, the, the show. Uh, it just shows you the breakdown of each semester for the data science. And I've highlighted areas that are common to all three structures. So we see there's a thread running through all of the platforms uh, to allow the, uh, the data or digital aspect of the uh, learning to come forward. 
Next slide, David, please. And the next one. I will just run through these so we can actually pick up later on uh, if anyone's got a discussion point on that. So the general GA principles, as I said, continuous, there are some continuous and final endpoint assessments. These assessments are sometimes exams. Uh, these are required when we need professional accreditation. We have web tests, both formative and summative, depending on the course you're undertaking. Uh, reports from direct learning, uh, coursework, which is contextualized to the workplace, and uh, work-based projects which are negotiated with the employer and these are all detailed, as I said, in the ILA or an individual learning agreement, uh, which is discussed in advance with the apprentice and the employer. But key to understand it is modifiable. So it's not just once it's written, it's set. We understand that businesses do change. We've just had a major shift in some of the businesses we've uh, worked with due to COVID. So we have to modify our approach in certain ways. Next slide, thank you. The academic year fits within uh, the the normal uh, offering year and, and the uh, starts in September and we have the assessment milestones at the end of semesters one, two and three. As I've mentioned, there's two types of coursework with uh, different approaches. The work based learning, which can take up 80 percent, which is built around the practical and theoretical exercises with evidence to back them up, demonstrating understanding and the ability to apply. The content will be agreed with the employer in advance to prevent any uh, breach of IP and also core course work, which is 20%, which is assessed on the campus and that may lead for may lead to some exams and also submission of coursework materials. Next slide, David, please. As I mentioned, the projects where necessary, we look to have devised projects by the company and the apprentice. We negotiate them so we can gain access as a university two key areas within the business and that ensures their syllabus and outcomes are met. As I said, one industry and one academic supervisor is required for each person on the course to allow them to maintain and keep on top of the requirements of the project. Through that, we have regular uh, supervisory meetings between the learner and the university. Again, these are flexible and can be on site, conference call, Skype, Microsoft Teams, as we have just now. And obviously a meeting report is produced by the apprentice to ensure we are capturing all the outcomes required for their overall degree. So what are the benefits? To the employer, employee, sorry, there's no fees, no upfront fees, no student loan uh, and your, or, or to your employer. So it's just commitment and it is commitment what's required. You're paying, uh, earning what you're learning, so you're getting paid. And you also have full time employee and student status here at the university. You're developing your skills, you're putting into practice real time situations in a workplace and within a simulated uh, academic space as well. It can fast track your career as you grow your academic and professional skills. And as I said, you have, you have a fully fledged student here at Herit Watt accessing all university facilities uh, when we come back to normal. And obviously the honours degree award, you graduate with the same level of qualification uh, as awarded here at Herit Watt University. The next slide, the next slide uh, is taken from the uh, Skills Development Scotland, which was posted in March. The benefits for employers, uh, the release data shows that 87% of employers noticed an improved workforce sustainability. Uh, and also it allows them to fulfill, uh, fill gaps, so 72% uh, address the gaps that they had and also retention, retention was increased by 7% uh, and loyalty as well because you are putting in a lot of time and effort into the individual and they are doing back so we, you see that building of the uh, loyalty and retaining the ability within the, the business. But the best thing I can see from that is gaining new thinking and ideas. This is the stretching element of being able to increase the thinking and the degree sense within the company and the individual. It allows them to come back with new ideas and potentially push the direction of travel for each company as well as themselves within the business. Next slide, David, please. Really, that's the, 
the end of the, the, the slideshow for now. We have got our own web page there and you can email any questions or ask for further information via the email address there. Normally we'd be able to take the call uh, on the number shown, but again, best method would be to go through the email address currently shown. Next slide, David, please. And that's really the end of the show and it's open up uh, for question and answers from anyone on Graduate Apprentices here at Heritage Watt. Thanks, Andy, and thanks, Sarah. Yeah, sure. Um, so, folks, um, obviously there's quite a lot to take in there. Uh, some really good content from Sarah and Sandy. So, um, now is a tricky bit where you have to ask a question, or you can ask a question either verbally or you can use the little chat function on the, the team call. So, David, if I just want to jump in just to start sure. the ball, we'll leave it here. So the, uh, I think one of the main questions, well, one question we normally get leveled at is, is uh, how do you find an apprentice? Now, we do have uh, a very good website. So we, the uh, the GA family, it's apprenticeship.scot, and that's where you go to look uh, and post any job uh, vacancies you may have. Uh, the team here at Herrick Watt are quite well versed in actually uh, putting these adverts up, so they can help. Uh, drive that forward if you require. So it's not as if it's you know, we'll leave you alone to basically find a GA. We can actually help you on that journey as well. So it's just one to sort of put out there, maybe a question that somebody may have had in their head. It's how to find somebody on the GA. But that's one area we start with. Thanks, Sonny. I see uh, Gavin's got his hand up. Gavin, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, I better start asking the questions, eh? Uh, hopefully uh, drive everyone else <laughs> to do it. But um, what's the application process and what does that involve? Does it involve a personal statement from the candidate themselves or? Yeah, Gavin, good, good question. We uh, the, the process itself is quite straightforward. Uh, as long as we can identify an individual who is working a full time role within a company, living and working in Scotland, and they're academically sound, and that's just a, a check on their job role, job description, their CV, and their qualifications. Then we'll do that as a background check, so to speak. If we feel they are uh, suitable for the course, we'll then present it to our academic colleagues who may want to speak with them uh, just as a, a, a touch point to ensure they are fully aware of the course and it is suitable for them, and also to do cross-reference on the company itself. To make sure the company is or has the ability to expose the individual to all the avenues of, of the, the degree itself and the work base uh, element of it. So it's quite a straightforward process. Once we've identified the individual, the paperwork is very slick in the background. We've been doing this for four years now. We are well versed. So the key point is just getting the right person and having them you know, basically committed to the course. Uh, and also then after that, the employer is involved and it just runs pretty smoothly after that. Thank you. Thanks, Gavin. Is that Gavin again? Or? Yeah, sorry. Can I just ask one more? It's just yeah, why yeah. I, uh, sure. I might as well get all my questions in at once. <laughs> um, uh, how many uh, current graduate apprentices do you have on the courses just now? Uh, and what's the limit of the course? What's the, sorry, the, the maximum intake uh, every year? Well, a couple of questions in there. We've been running for the last four years, so we have in excess, you know, over 400 uh, GAs doing the course over the four year period. Uh, this year, obviously, we have a slight change due to the COVID issue. Uh, and so we're, that's why we're looking at a January start. We're trying to support businesses. We had a three month sort of uh, stop point. We've restarted it. So we're looking at if, if companies do require to upskill, reskill individuals, there's an opportunity to continue that. So this year we haven't quite met our target overall, but we're still pushing towards that. To answer the next part of the question, how many on the course? It is just how many that a company can support going through. Now, that varies company to company. We do have some big uh, and international companies on our books who can then you know, supply maybe five, ten individuals out of the business on one day to carry out this work. So that's a lot to ask for a smaller to small SME uh, company as well. So we, we, we look at it, uh, there's no real top limit, but if somebody was to come in with two, three, all the way up to 20, it's, a, it's basically an open house for them. That's excellent. Thank you very much. That's all my questions you'll be pleased to hear. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Sandy? Yeah. Sarah? I just thought it might be um, worthwhile explaining how people might have a, an advanced entry and not have to do full four years. 
Good point, Sarah. Yeah, it was one that I didn't touch on. The, uh, we, we may have, in certain circumstances, individuals who have prior learning, uh, for example, an HNC, Stroke D, or other uh, professional qualifications that may accelerate some of their uh, entry requirements into our second year and extreme cases into the third year. Uh, however, again, that goes back to the question that I said to Gavin earlier, it's down to the individual. Now, that's when the academic team will make a, a judgment call on their ability. And although we may have an HNC uh, which, or HND, it could be 15 years old, we, we may want to reset you back into year one because that information is probably out of date now. So we're looking at the best interests of the individual. Uh, where we are trying to ensure there's no loss of time. We can accelerate, we will, but we also don't want to set people up for failure. So we want to make sure they, they enter at the right level. Uh, and again, that's down to an individual basis. Thanks, Andy. Right. So can I ask a question then? If you had someone who had completed an MA, would they be eligible to go into the second year of a GA? Again, this is where you have to look at the MA framework, slightly different, okay. uh, depending on the, the area they're in. Certain MAs are at level seven, so that's the HND, uh, HNC sorry, level. Others are at level six. We have to be very careful of where we're going to position the MA. They're, uh, again, down to an individual basis. It's down to the MA they're on and pro progression. Uh, close to my heart, engineering. If you had an ME coming in at first year, they wouldn't have done the, the level of maths that would have been required on the ME. So that would be a, 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 a point that would stop them straight away. So we have to look at you know the actual entry points. It may well be, through discussion, uh, prudent to actually put them to one of our partner colleges and put them on an HNC for a year to upskill that to that level we require. Oh, well, that's great to hear there's that collaboration. That's brilliant. Thank you. Well, if nobody's got any other questions. Sorry, David, I was going to say there's one thing I was just run through my mind. It's uh, although we spoke about a lot of uh, talent, the one thing we have to sort of maybe put out there as a, as a marker, the, uh, there's no age barrier to a GA. So it's not just directed at young people, it's directed at everyone within the company. So it allows anyone, doesn't matter what age, there's no barriers to entry into the GA, it's just the commitment we require. Uh, for that. And another thing is the, the sort of pan Scotland approach we have now at Herrick Watt. We're not just limited to the local area. Uh, we we're looking at right across Scotland and to, to enable the delivery and upskilling of staff in key areas uh, to enable the economy to move forward. Oh, uh, there's a question just coming from Hamish. Um, what project specific support for businesses can these courses offer? Uh, okay, Hamish, if I'm reading that right, the, uh, the support for well, the project, if, if that's a project part of the degree you're looking at, the projects themselves are very much industry focused. So if there's something happening or you want something to happen within the industry or the, 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 the company you're with, the, the individual can get access obviously to that internally within the company. But also if you flip it on its head, you have a lot of well uh, versed individuals here at Herit Watt who will be interested in see how projects happen within the industrial uh, sphere and allow them to, to gain access and also be part of that project as well. So you have almost a library or resource here at Herit Watt that could obviously assist you if you're looking to drive forward a project which is internal to a company. Uh, if that's what I'm, how, how the, the question has been read, if, if that answers the question. OK, thanks. Okay, thanks, Hamish. Um, so I think, I don't know, it's maybe Sarah, you touched on this, and maybe Sandy. Hamish just asked us a follow-up question there in terms of are there any shorter courses available? Um, I'll start. There, there have been, and I think there will be, um, in terms of we had a program, and, and Sandy, you know the details a bit better than I, of Upskilling Scotland, where you could send people to do a module of an MBA program um, and then they could cumulatively do modules at different times or stretch it out um, to gain a full certification. Um, we are hoping in the new year to be able to have courses that are very much focused in this digital arena. So data, um, 
uh, digital engineering development um, and that like in in smaller chunks um, and also in uh, we're looking at different programs in digital leadership so um, addressing the needs of mid and senior level execs uh, to embrace that digital transformation technology and understand the best approach there so it's a little bit a case of watch this space for those right now but sandy you may know more about um what we have right now on the in the picture that people can apply to yeah, the, the, there's, it's a follow on and it's part of uh, Henry Watt's response to the, the COVID crisis. And we have uh, issued a prospectus for recovering growth. Uh, and obviously, GEs uh, form part of that. And we're looking at the uh, how Henry Watt can support, continue the, the, our commitment to support and develop staff for the new, as Sarah says, for the new digital age. So we're looking at bite size uh, learning where we can. Uh, and it allows us to then develop you know, the, uh, the skills, staff, at the right time as the business starts to regrow itself in the new digital arena. So we did have a, a lot of uh, funding from the Scottish Government to reboot uh, the economy at the beginning there. We're hoping to revisit that where we can and when we can get the money. But certainly, here at what are looking at the smaller bite size, as, as uh, Sarah mentioned there, some of the higher uh, sort of management tier learning as well. So there's a number of uh, new uh, say ideas coming out for the prospectus and a recovery for growth uh, here at Head Watch. So it's a case of watch this space uh, and where we find something of, of, of interest, we will certainly publicise it uh, across the our Head at Watch webpage. Thanks, Sandy. Thanks, Sarah. Sure. Okay, just while we're through it. Yeah, so listen, uh, thanks very much, Sarah and Sandy, for your time today, and thanks all for joining joining the call this afternoon. I hope you found it interesting and useful. And as Sandy said, if anybody's got any further questions, please email the the graduate apprenticeships mailbox in the first instance and from there one of the team will get back to you as quickly as possible. Um, so that email address just for a wee reminder is ga at hw.ac.uk. Um, OK, with that, I think we shall wrap it up. Great. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone. Thanks all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.